Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to Madison's Notes, the official podcast of Princeton University's James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. I'm your host, Annika Nordquist. I'm very excited about today's guest, Dr. Teresa Bichon, who's a prominent political theorist at Oriel College, Oxford. What I love so much about Dr. Bejan's work is her ability to bring a really valuable historical perspective to the topics most hotly debated today, such as tolerance and freedom of speech, the topics of her first book, Near Civility. Dr. Bejan recently came to us at the Madison Program and gave our Charles E. Test lecture series, which was called First Among Equals and investigated the history of the concept of political equality. Today, we're going to continue that conversation, chat about what equality is, where it comes from, what equity is, whether that's the same thing as equality, and how the political movements of the early modern period, like the levelers, diggers, and Quakers, impacted the way that we think about these concepts today. If you enjoy this conversation, the link to her original three-part lecture series on the same topic with us is both on our website, jmp.princeton.edu, and in the show notes of this episode. You can also find in the show notes the link to her book, Near Civility, if you want to learn more about Professor Bichon's views on freedom of speech. So with no further ado, I really hope you enjoyed this discussion just as much as I did. Teresa, welcome to the show. It's wonderful to have you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. One of the things that's really interesting about your work uh, is you're trying to, in your words, restore shared meanings to fraught disagreement. Um, And in the news right now, there's this big debate about equality and equity. And so your work is extremely relevant uh, to those debates. So kicking us off there, when you kind of look at those words, uh, you know, equality and equity, and then you add, you've added in your work a third word, parity. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about what each of those three words mean in your mind. Mm. Well, I mean, maybe I should just start by saying that it was the lack of clarity in my own mind that sort of got me really interested in working on this topic because, you know, my first book was on the concept of civility and I sort of got onto that topic much the same way of noticing a word being bandied about in political disagreement and then realizing that neither I nor the people sort of banding that word about seemed to have a really clear sense of what they meant by it. So sort of I got interested Mm -hmm. in equality for the same reason. But right, as you say, I mean, we're in this sort of strange moment now where um, equality is slightly in bad odor, Mm. I think. Um, Equality, I think, used to be seen as really the principle of the left as opposed to the right caring perhaps a bit more about liberty. Mm. Um, But now I think many on the left are sort of have grown suspicious of equality. They sort of equate it with a kind of sameness, a commitment to sameness, a hostility Mm. to difference, also um, as a kind of commitment to certain forms of colorblindness Mm. uh, that, you know, that we committed to not seeing the differences between us. Whereas equity, I think, is put forward as a political ideal that's more sensitive to difference, that takes our differences into account. Um, But if we think about the history of these words, I think, you know, certainly if we look at uh, classical Latin sources, equality and equity are very sort of closely identified and difficult to disaggregate. Mm. Sort of um, sometimes it seems like these terms can be used interchangeably. Right. So in my own work, what I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do conceptual work, trying to bring these things apart. Equality strikes me as being a kind of concept that, that permits of many different conceptions. People understand equality in different ways. But generally speaking, equality um, as an ideal uh, is uh, has, carries a sense of uh, precision. So equality mm-hmm. is a kind of principle where we're, we're able to sort of measure um, measure and so obviously it lends itself really well to questions of how much people should get of something, um, some social good. So questions of distributive justice, uh, but equality can also be a social or relational ideal. So how do we relate to one another as equals? And there, there's a sense that everybody is um, on the same level, or you know, have we we have this phrase equal standing? Um, equity, by contrast, I think is really linked to ideas of fairness. 
Um, so in English common law, you have the, the courts of equity and the idea is equity courts are, you know, making decisions uh, that go beyond the letter of the law, adapting uh, justice to individual circumstances. Uh, so equity, I think, seems to have a link with fairness and a kind of uh, responsiveness to particular circumstances. But then, as you say, also partly what I'm doing in the book is trying to recover parity as uh, another ideal, mm. another sort of very ancient ideal um, that was often understood as being sort of related to equality, but also distinct. So parity um, is really a social ideal where uh, it's this I- idea of sort of um, relating to, to, to one another as peers, um, as sharing in a kind of virtue or value despite our differences or in the midst of our differences. So parity, interestingly, is a kind of relation that can obtain between um, uh, p- you know, things that don't share a unit of measure. So mm-hmm. in quality, we think we can measure. Parity, we can't measure. We, we judge, we discern. Are these two things? Are these two people alike enough to be on a par? Are they sharing in some kind of valuable trait mm-hmm. to the appropriate extent that we can sort of treat them to treat them on this uh, on this sort of uh, this quality of treatment. I think parity often has a kind of qualitative dimension. Mm. But as you can see, just in my answer to you, I mean, all yeah. these concepts feed in and out. But what I'm trying to do is make some distinctions and see if they can't help us get a little bit um, farther and kind of understanding what we actually care about yeah. and what we actually mean. Yeah, absolutely. Which is super important work. Um, and you're one of the few people who's willing to ask or even has thought of asking, and this has been one of my big frustrations with the debate about this, the kind of more controversial question of like equality in what? Mm. Uh, Because the word equality by itself doesn't really denote anything unless you have some kind of standard by which people are equal. Um, And so there are, I think, certainly from like a more Marxist perspective, equality is often viewed as like purely economic equality. Um, And then there's a Christian perspective that's like equal in the eyes of God. Um, And there are various other perspectives in between a legal perspective, which has a long history uh, Mm -hmm. and various other kind of ways in which you can measure people in comparison to each other. So I'm wondering what your views are Um, when we talk about equality kind of in a modern sense. What do you think we mean? And what maybe to be even a little more controversial, what should we mean? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, there's a there's a long standing debate in yeah. academic political theory and political philosophy, uh, the sort of equality of what yeah. debate. So Amartya Sen, famously a Nobel uh, laureate, economist and philosopher, asked this question. And, and sort of the assumption was, I think, among political theorists and, and philosophers for a long time that in the modern era, everyone was a kind of egalitarian yeah. in the sense that they they held equality to be a important value. So a kind of uh, political principle, uh, an ideal at which to aim, but Mm. also that they were committed to equality as a kind of premise of political argument. And in that sense, equality as the equality of human beings as such, or if we're, you know, moral philosophers, the equality of persons. Mm. Um, And so for the equality of what debate, it was sort of a, well, we, we're all egalitarians here. Yeah. Now, is there a kind of single uh, equalizandum, sort of a single g- good that if that we should be focusing on equalizing? Um, is it welfare, for instance? Mm. Is it um, uh, capabilities? You know, do, is it capacity for human flourishing, these kinds of things? You know, what is it that an egalitarian should be concerned about equalizing? Um, but that debate, I think, came under, you know, pressure and increasing criticism, certainly in the late 90s, just with the observation that a lot of the kinds of questions that we have about justice or mm. which we want to appeal to equality as kind of principle are not really questions of distributive justice. They're not about how much yeah. of something someone has. Yeah. Um, a lot of questions of social justice might have a kind of economic and material dimension. Surely they will. But we're also concerned about things like social status and standing, respect, um, you know, how uh, increasingly questions of kind of you know, different people's just experience uh, mm-hmm. based on their uh, identities very often. It's kind of an de- identity question. So I think there was a turn in the late 90s and early 2000s from kind of uh, 
equality as a principle of distributive justice to equality as a relational ideal. Mm. So kind of what does it really mean to stand as equals together and to relate to one another as equals? And on that view, equality then brings in considerations of material distribution, wealth, et cetera, how much of something you have, income um, and wealth, uh, equality and inequality, but also kind of a uh, social equality in terms mm. of class differences, uh, concerns about things like um, hate speech or, right. you know, just say, you know, uh, dignity and how, how people are regarded um, by their co-citizens. And then obviously the, the great uh, longstanding concern of legal equality, equality of rights, rights before the law. Um, so the relational egalitarian view is, I find, attractive because it, it unites all of these considerations, mm. all these kinds of different areas where we might care about equality. But the problem is that once you bring all those things in, what equality actually looks like in each of those domains becomes very, very yep. fuzzy again. And I suppose one of the things that drew me to using the language of parity to try to make sense of these um, these questions is that parity is about comparison. Right. So... A good example of a parity question is, is this sort of is this comparatively disadvantaged member of our society uh, being treated on a par with the advantaged member of our society? Mm. You know, so can differentially placed people nevertheless kind of recognize themselves as being treated on a par, that things will go for them in sort of more or less the same way? And there I think it, that captures our worries, for instance, about extreme wealth inequality mm. in certain societies. Um uh, questions about, uh, you know, uh, racism or sexism, you know, the sort of questions of identity or people who are, um, you know, members of certain identity groups uh, experiencing the same quality of treatment. Mm. Um, how are things going for them? It's that sort of experience of, of, of citizenship. Um, and but then as I've just said there, that seems to be a kind of comparative judgment that's made in the context of particular societies. Right. And that cuts against the kind of universalism of equality as the equality of human beings as such, mm. this kind of sense of moral or human equality as transcending particular communities and being about things like human rights, human rights that we enjoy mm. independently of whatever society we happen to live in. Um, so, yeah, so th I mean, that those kinds of questions of comparative judgments versus um, absolute measurement in mm. distribution. I think uh, making a distinction between equality and parity in particular, I think, can kind of help us tease apart what it, you know, s sort of some of the things we care about in, 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 given, uh, in given situations. Yeah, I know we're talking a lot about definitions here, but there's <laughs> one more that I want to harp on before we kind of dive more into the meat of this. Um, you sort of popped the word egalitarian into that, mm, which is a mm. word that comes up a lot in your work and your discussions um, and a word that you've criticized in some contexts. So talk to me a little bit about what egalitarian is um, and how it's correct and maybe incorrect to use in certain circumstances. Yeah, good. Good question. Um, so the critical observation I make in the book yeah. is that um, the term egalitarian is a 19th century coinage, and it is used to describe the kind of popular legacy of the French Revolution and sort of to mm. characterize political programs that are in some way committed to the equality of human beings as such. Yeah. So that they, it's, it's the family of political views that takes human equality as its starting point. Mm. Um, so there we might say that's the sort of wide understanding of, of, of egalitarianism. On that view, you know, utilitarianism is an egalitarian doctrine. Mm. Libertarianism is an egalitarian doctrine. Communism is an egalitarian doctrine. Right. right? You might say that's actually a very broad view Then we could plausibly say, well, then most most modern political theories are in some sense egalitarian. And this is very much the, the argument that Ronald Dworkin made. He mm. sort of insisted that every modern political theory uh, occupied what he called the uh, quote-unquote egalitarian plateau mm. and that they sort of shared this premise. Now, I'm skeptical right. of that because I think there are plenty of modern political theories that don't, in fact, right. share that premise. But then I think we could also then say there's a narrower sense of egalitarianism as being the set of political ideologies that take equality as a uh, a kind of conclusion, sort of saying equality mm. is the ideal to be pursued. It's not just the place where we start, the assumption that humans are equal, but also that a just society be, will be one wherein they are equalized yep. in some way. Um, 
But sort of as a historian, the observation then is, is well, okay, um, we have this label egalitarian and we can apply it in wider and more restrictive ways in, in a way that makes sense. But the problem you run into is that this label then begins to be applied to much earlier mm. arguments. So applying the label egalitarian to people who um, were living and writing long before the French Revolution. And so there I really worry about anachronism, right. where we end up using the egalitarian label as a way of organizing figures in the history of political thought in a way that sort of uh, misrepresents, in mm. fact, uh their their views misrepresents their arguments. And even worse, I sort of worry that the egalitarian label especially has sort of started to be used as a kind of um, just evaluative descriptive term in the history mm. of political thought where we sort of use it and we apply it to the to the the people we like or we sort of mm. see to be progressive or ahead of their time. And then um, and so that really worries, worries me as an intellectual historian, because I think, yeah. you know, um, I'm not saying that it's never right to use anachronistic labels to characterize the views of historical figures. I think sometimes that's defensible. There are certain arguments, say, in the 17th century that I think that we could plausibly characterize as egalitarian. But, mm. you know, I would insist on lots of caveats. But just this sort of, it's, I think historians and political theorists have become very sloppy mm. in the way that they use this term. And so partly what I'm doing in the project is saying, we've no, we've got to be a lot stricter. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting to me that you label the French Revolution as kind of mm. like the turning point in the way that we think about this, um, because there are all there's two kind of really major. There are probably more, but two in particular that come to mind, major historical events that really impact the way people think about equality that happened before the French Revolution, the American founding mm. um, and the Christian Revolution, uh, which to my mind is if you had asked me before looking into your work and talking mm. with you, like, what is the snap moment where suddenly people care about equality where before they didn't, that, you know, would have been it. So I guess starting, I want to ask the American Revolution as well. Um, but starting with the kind of Christian pagan transition, it, in your work, you say that a lot of our ideas about equality have roots in Roman law, which was surprising to me because in my knowledge of Roman law, I mean, it was like a completely separate set of rules based on whether you were rich or you were poor, both during the Republic and during the Empire. Mm. Um, so talk to me a little bit about how the kind of pre-Christian roots feed into our current ideas about equality. So I'll answer that, but can I just say yeah. a, a little bit about the French Revolution first? Yeah, please. I mean, so what's interesting about or distinctive about the French Revolution, so when I say that egalitarianism is, uh, you know, is a post-French revolutionary kind of idea, mm. that just has to do with the centrality of egalité right. in that revolutionary movement. And um, so Darren McMahon, who's an excellent historian at Dartmouth, is uh, going to soon be publishing a book on on the history of equality as an idea. Mm. And McMahon argues, and I think he's right, that there is something peculiar about the way that equality as egalité gets basically sacralized right. during the French Revolution as being elevated as kind of one of the most important political ideals. Whereas, you know, one of the things that comes out in my work is that Lots of people care about equality all yeah. of the time, but the idea that somehow equality would enjoy a special status mm. among political ideals, that I think is something that, you know, that, that has to do mm -hmm. with some the strangeness of, of the French Revolution. And I would there I would contrast the way that egalité functions in the French Revolution, even from how the way that equality functions during the American Revolution. Yeah. Let's actually then we'll come back to the Christian thing, but mm -hmm. let's start there. Uh, what actually is the difference between those things? And when we talk about equality today in an American context, is the way that we talk about it, does it come from like the kind of originally American idea of it in the American Revolution or from the kind of French egalité intellectual legacy? <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's I think it's both. I, I think especially for um People uh, on the left who would I who would identify themselves as egalitarians. Mm. I think the the popular legacy of the French Revolution as worrying very much about 
not just equality under the law, mm. but equality of status and standing, mm. and especially then caring about material inequalities. Mm. Um, the figure of the sans culotte is, you know, right. is is tearing down the aristocrat. I mean, that sense that the French Revolution understood equality as also entailing a kind of social revolution, mm. I think, is distinctive. Um, American, you know, American ideas of equality, I think, ha- did have and may- maybe continued to have more of a sense of equality as having to do with the rule of law mm. and equality having to do with uh, spiritual equality, yeah, kind of Christian ideas of equality. And... Um, so again, you know, I'm sort of conscious of speaking slightly beyond my sphere. I'm an early modernist. Right, and I'm right, really right. interested in the prehistory of all of this. But right. I do think that there are different political traditions and different linguistic traditions hmm. connected with egalité right. and equality. Right. And so we very often just sort of think of them as the same thing. Mm. You know, it's just egalité is the French word for equality. Mm. But actually, I think that the the way that these uh, how these ideas get theorized and then also how their practice become very they just look very different in different places. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, and I suppose that leads back to the question of. Yeah. I mean, Rome. Super, <laughs> yeah. Super fascinating. And I guess like I mean, to yeah, back to the Rome point, I mean, in a world in the ancient world in which if you were you would have I mean truly completely different sets of punishments about you know whether or not you were liable um, to execution or or not you know completely dependent like your literally your life was on the line depending on your social class mm. um, in the eyes of the law where in that world do you see the roots of modern ideas about equality so this is a really interesting and important observation. And I think it's one that um, people maybe don't uh, think about as much as they should, right? <laughs> so so there's this kind of puzzle, yeah. right? There's this puzzle. So the when I say that um, the idea of human equality has deep roots in Roman law, I'm referring to the idea that is preserved um, in uh, just... Justinian's digest of, of the civil law mm. in the 6th century, but is sort of uh, collecting um, commentaries by jurists from the 3rd century and also the 1st century um, uh, CE, that uh, omnes homines aequales sunt. Mm. All humans are equal. Mm. Right. So that's there. That phrase is there. And so in that in that expert, uh, extract from uh, Opian, who's, commenta- who's commentating on Sabinus, the idea is with respect to the natural law, all humans are equal, but with respect to the civil law, they are not. And indeed, there's this fundamental distinction right. between those who are free and those who are slaves. Mm. So what to make of this, right? I mean, I'm so interested in, in, in how and why the idea of human equality with respect to natural law becomes a commonplace within a Roman Empire that is growing increasingly hierarchical. Yeah, definitely. Right? So the idea that human beings are equal by nature is completely alien to yeah. a relatively democratic or inclusive society like, you know, Athenian democracy. Nevertheless, human equality catches on in this kind of imperial, highly hierarchical context. And so the argument there is that um, equality in in this sense, in the Roman law, has very much to do with the idea of human beings as such as being governed by law. Mm. So equality, I read in that sense, as being about thinking about the the law bearing indifferently on everyone. Mm. Cicero will make this point, actually, when he's talking about about equality in the law the idea that so the equality so legal equality for cicero has to do with the fact uh, has to do with just the unity of law mm. the civil law he's talking about is the same mm. it's content it's content does not change mm. depending on who you are now that content differentiates people on the basis of all of these personal um, right. statuses and, and and conditions absolutely but the content of the law doesn't change that's what cicero means mm. and i think there's a kind of similar sense in these later later uh jurists where the natural law is universally binding mm. nobody can escape right judgment but of course 
that universality of law that sort of I think about this in terms of what I call equality as indifference um right. the la- the law bears indifferently on everyone it doesn't distinguish between different types of people um in terms of being obligated but that obligation then becomes the basis on which people are then distinguished <laughs> so criminals are punished for right. instance the virtuous are rewarded all of these things so I think the really the Roman sense of human equality is intimately connected with hierarchy. Mm. It's the idea that we're all kind of subject to some kind of law um, that then becomes the basis of just hierarchies. Mm. Um, And that, I think, is very a very foreign way of thinking about equality from the modern perspective, where we want to think of equality and hierarchy as being Opposites. Opposites. Yeah. It's just basically that equality excludes hierarchy. Whereas I think in these sort of pre-modern arguments, no, 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 equality is understood as being almost normatively hierarchical. So mm. we're, we're all equal, which means that just distinctions can be made between us. Mm. Try to explain that for me a little bit more. How is it possible um, that equality could be the basis, not not just coexist, but actually be the basis of hierarchy? Well, I think, you know, so here, maybe I'll use an actual modern example yeah. to sort of show you that maybe the idea isn't as alien as you think <laughs> it is. Um, so think about modern meritocracy. Mm. So the idea is it's we're all equal and we're competing on an equal playing field. Yeah. And that is what legitimates then right. the unequal outcomes. Right. 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 That's what makes those just. Right. So that's very modern sort of meritocratic, uh, way, the modern way of thinking about meritocracy. I mean, but I think that it's consistent with sort of older ideas of thinking about, well, because we're all going to be um, judged yeah. yeah, according to the same law, according right. to the same standard, and we're all going to be judged by the same judge, whether that's nature, whether that's God, we can see how these ideas become Christianized. That's how we can be confident then that the kind of distinctions between us, between mm. um, uh, the, the the virtuous and the vicious, between the saved and the damned, et cetera, that those are kind mm. of just distinctions. They're not arbitrary. Mm. Um, so that, I think, is an important sense of equality as kind of uh, being sort of supportive of hierarchies. But there's also another sense, which is important, of everybody is equal in so po- insofar as they are uh, arbitrarily placed in a way. So we're sort of mm. thrown into the world and we're placed in different positions, but everybody is equally thrown. This is <laughs> an idea like you also get. A weird version of Rawls, I guess. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, But I think, you know, so there are these kind of older stoic ideas and you have sort yeah. of precursors in, 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 in the sophist where... Equality is really about um, the uh, the universal features of the human condition, where everybody everybody is subject to death. We all mm. die. Yeah, um, death is the great equalizer. Everybody, uh, there's, they also speak about the sun shining on everyone, mm. um, regardless of the differences between us. Mm. Um, and so, equality is indifference. There, I think, is also a way of thinking about well. Equality is the perspective through which the differences between us appear as matters of indifference. They don't mm. matter as much. Um, so in both cases, equality and hierarchy are sort of relating in complex mm. ways. They're not opposites. They're kind of, they can be mutually constitutive. They can just be consistent. You can right. be placed within hierarchies in a way that also acknowledges a more sort of fundamental equality. Um, and then also we can even just think uh, in sort of even later kind of Christian or sort of uh, Christian Platonist ideas of the great chain of being. Actually, right. human equality becomes about occupying the same rung within right. this cosmic right. hierarchy. And so that's a very profoundly hierarchical yeah. view. Um So, again, so I'm not going to argue that there's kind of one way of understanding the relationship between them. I'm just what I'm trying to do as a historian of political thought is to point out the complexity of ways that equality and hierarchy can be seen as kind of co-constitutive and that belie our sense as kind of modern, um, you know, egalitarians of some description, the sense that, okay, well, to be committed to equality is necessarily to be skeptical of hierarchy or to say that hierarchies are... um, sort of uh, 
yeah, hi- hierarchies are to be uh, to, to to be suspected that equality precludes hierarchy, and that hierarchy is always mm-hmm. in need of justification. Yeah, the interesting thing to me about that view is, I think, in in America right now, and maybe you'll agree, maybe you'll disagree with me that these two are mutually exclusive ideas. But I think there's there's certainly some way in which they are. Um, there's this idea like equality is super important. We're all equal. Equality is the goal. Uh, but also at the same time, this idea that like you're all special and we're each, you know, it's like a very kind of elevated view of of the human person and of mm-hmm. equality. Whereas what you're describing is more like we're all equally bound under the burden of the law, like slowly being crushed by our imminent death. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess do do you agree that like those two ideas that we have then are mutually exclusive? Is there a way to kind of wed those two? Oh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I no, I, I don't have a theory which is going to unite all these yeah, disparate yeah, yeah, ways yeah. to think about. But I just, I would but just say that the observation guess, is yeah. a good one because does it make sense that we think both? Then I'll rephrase. Yeah, and I think <laughs> both have b- both have you know yeah. long standing roots. So yeah. um, you know, I we might distinguish these between between these as kind of. Uh, equality as a kind of principle of of leveling up, or yeah. equality as a principle of kind of leveling down, and 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 again, so the I you know very often Christian ideas of equality um, can you know have features of both. So we're equal in so far as we're all created of yeah. dust, and we all yeah. die. You know, to dust we shall return. Or the idea that um, we're all equally sinful right. so original sin is a great sort of uh, idea of a kind of uh, equality as a matter of our humility yeah before god um but then there are also these ideas of equality as having to do with the intrinsic dignity or worth of human beings as the idea and again you have these very um you know these ancient Roots, but the idea of the human beings are distinguished and as, as being sort of the closest beings to gods in virtue of our reason. So reason being a godlike faculty, and our quality there is a sort of high status mm. that brings us closer, closer to um, the spiritual realm or the divine realm. Um, and I think that you know that tension is always there. Um, and can lead a little bit. I mean, there is a little bit of a kind of um, uh, sort of bipolar sort of you're being, you know, the equality can be invoked and mm. to stress our um, our, uh, our our humble right. nature or it can be invoked in order to sort of claim a, an elevated status or standing. Yeah. And you've you've brought up this is a little bit of a tangent, but you brought up this word level and you've written a lot about the levelers who I I mean, well, really, you've written about three groups. You've written about the levelers, the diggers and the Quakers in America. We love Quakers. We know who Quakers are. The first two, um, much less so. Um, So in the history of equality, um, yeah, they, they play a really interesting role. Talk to me about, I mean, I guess first, what is the difference between these three groups that we can kind of very easily lump together? Mm. Um, and talk to me about what their legacy, just to kind of as a broader thing before we dig into the details, what their legacy has been on the idea of equality. Yeah, so um, I'm interested in all of these groups. So broadly speaking, they're all uh, groups of religious and or political radicals um, mm. who are active during the second half of the English Civil War, or Civil Wars um, in the 1640s and then into the early mm. years of the English Republic. So Charles I is tried and executed in 1649 and England becomes uh, a republic. Um, and, you know, and is a republic uh, and, you know, governed by um, a military dictator for right. the latter part of it <laughs> until the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. But so there's just this kind of remarkable period in mm. uh, early modern English history where you have this fluorescence of these movements. And it used to be that um, historians, as you say, would sort of lump them together as the radicals of yeah. the period. Um, you know, you got a lot of historians writing about the the left wing or the far mm-hmm. left of the English Revolution. Um, but as you say, I mean, I'm interested really to tease them apart. So I think probably the um, 
the most politically important of these is groups is the Levelers, yeah. and that's a group of um, London-based uh, uh, activists. In you know, they sort of really get going in 1645-46, and they are really um, vocal proponents of legal and political reform mm. in the context of the Civil War. And so um, they push for things like um, uh, uh, the right of every, you know, so is it the famously they're, they're calling, their uh, rallying cry is the rights of freeborn Englishmen and sort of claiming mm. Magna Carta as the birthright of every English man and woman. Um, so they are early proponents of things that we would later come to think of as sort of, you know, natural rights. Yeah. Um, it used to be very often that the levelers were read as uh, just obvious precursors to Locke. Mm. Um, I think that's sort of less done nowadays because I think people just, you know, aren't as interested in, in the in the uh, radicalism of the Civil War as, as they used to be. But the levelers um, also argue for things like the right of every Englishman to trial by jury. Um, and famously, at the Putney debates of 1647, leveler agents push for um, a unicameral, unicameral legislature mm. elected annually, ways of holding representatives to account, so accountability measures, and most famously for a pretty... Uh, pretty ex, you know pretty big expansion of the franchise mm. um so trying to get rid of the traditional um property qualification of 40 shillings freehold in land so those are the levelers and um so they are remembered i think and celebrated certainly in the 20th century as kind of early egalitarians early democrats early social contract theorists you know some people i you know there are articles about them as the first english libertarians i mean like it used to be that lots of people wanted to claim the levelers for the mm. beginning of the movement and by contrast i think the diggers then were you know valorized and remembered as the, as the sort of proto communists mm. of the okay. uh, 17th century so the diggers get going a little bit later than the levelers and actually the diggers style themselves as true levelers <laughs> which is uh pretty interesting but they are sort of religious radicals who are interested in um, practicing forms of spiritual and material community. And so digging is this is this practice whereby you basically level fences, you level mm. the hedges. So um, it's a kind of protest against enclosure. Mm. So the idea that during okay. enclosure, the common lands had been sort of uh, right. appropriated by uh Aristocrats are landed gentry. Uh, you know the the commoners were excluded from the the commons, and so what digging is is it's sort of pulling down the fences and reasserting your traditional right or privilege of access to common land to graze, to plant, etc. Um, and so the diggers uh, are in really interested in um, thinking about leveling as demanding not only. Um, the abolition of enclosures and, you know, and in some moments, the sort of abolition of private property altogether. Um, mm. And also thinking about uh, communalism in the sense of living together, sharing common meals, um, living together under the law of righteousness, et cetera. And so there was a, you know, the diggers were really popular among kind of uh, Marxist and Marxist historians in the in the 20th century who sort of saw them as the kind of proto-communists of the period. Um, but, you know, my own work on the diggers, I'm really interested in the religious arguments and mm. the um, and how a lot of this is reaching back to longer standing I, indigenous ideas in, in England of the, the rights of commoners, mm. the privileges of commoners and thinking of what it means to be a commoner. Um, and the Quakers, as you say, I mean, the, the Quakers are still with us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, if, but I, I am interested in the earliest days of the Quaker movement. Um, and so in the very beginning, so the Quakers really get going in the late 1640s, early 1650s. And they're just extremely um, socially disruptive. Mm. Uh, religious radicals. So they are um, kind of notorious for doing things like banging pots and pans in order to interrupt other people's church services. Quakers <laughs> are, you know, reputed to go naked for a sign, which is sort of a walking naked through the streets. It's wow. a kind of sign of their nakedness before Christ. But I'm really interested in uh, Quaker 
activism around things like hat honor, so refusing to take mm. off their hats to uh, to their social superiors, and the politics of pronouns. So the Quakers mm. insist on referring to everyone by the familiar thee and thou, and so they refuse to use the plural you. And they really which, lost that battle. I mean, yeah, no, spectacular they, defeat. <laughs> but they but they stuck at it. I mean, so yeah. I was really fascinated by um, you know, so today I think we can kind of um actually sort of an older generation of progressives sort of scratch their heads and sort of, why do kids these days care so much about pronouns? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I want to say, well, actually, no, this is a really longstanding concern um, because it's a, it's a, it's a concern about um, social hierarchy and yeah. the way that we acknowledge, acknowledge status differences every day, so the politics of everyday life. And so in the book, one of the things I'm doing is just pointing out that, you know, these are groups that are often lumped together, mm. but actually they have very different, really complex and in some some ways kind of really kind of nutty yeah. <laughs> ideas of what a society of equals should look like. Um, and so I'm interested to recover the the kind of uh, the specificity of those visions Um and uh, yeah, I just think it's intrinsically interesting. But then I also yeah. think it has it prefigures kind of contemporary uh, progressive concerns in, in interesting ways. Yeah, no, it definitely does. I mean, especially when you think about, I mean, the Marxist, I mean, Marx being another kind of like giant in mm. thinking about equality in intellectual history um, and the way that that has kind of claimed the levelers and diggers and all of that. But as, as you say, they're all three uh, levelers, diggers and Quakers extremely religious. So it's mm. interesting to me mm. that you draw that connection there. I mean, I sort of think of like the stereotypical, you know, Marxist guy who's not a Christian, but says, oh, Jesus would be a socialist and is like very <laughs> proud of himself for having thought of that. Um, <laughs> but talk to me a little bit more about how Christianity versus Marxism. Oh, that's interesting. So, well, look, I, I'm, I'm hardly the first early yeah. modern intellectual historian to sort of point out that a lot of the really wonderful yeah. um, historiography by Marxists, uh, primarily English Marxists in the 20th century, um, was sort of speciously secularizing. Yeah. That was sort of reading out the religion on purpose. Yeah. Um, so that, I mean, that's been acknowledged for a long time, and I think it's been corrected by historians. Mm. I think it's been maybe less corrected for by historians of political thought, mm. but largely because I think that in a way, historians of political thought just, I don't know, I think maybe like there's a way in which we sort of like, well, the diggers and Quakers are maybe, maybe they're like interesting, but they're not, you know, they're not really important yeah. or they're a little bit yeah. wacky. So, you know, they're sort of religious nuts that we don't really have to take seriously. Right. And with the right, levelers, right. we'll sort of focus on the common law arguments. We won't sort of mm. focus so much on, on the, um, the scriptural citations or these kinds of things. And it's just a constant battle I fight in my work to sort of say, well, no, actually, the scriptural citations are very important. Yeah. And a lot of the activism in the period yeah. is intimately connected to particular proof texts, yeah. in particular Acts 1034. Um, so God is no respecter of persons. Mm. Um, but he, I mean, yeah, on the on the sort of just more specifically, though, on the idea of the of of the Marxist appropriation mm. of these people, or so the Marxist position on equality. I mean, again, to to big up Darren McMahon's book, I mean, something he's written on and he's absolutely right to focus on is that actually Marx and Engels themselves were very critical of equality. Mm. I didn't know that, actually. That's yeah, so it's so... Equality is not obviously a Marxist hmm. okay. principle. Actually, Marx is really interested in you know, fr from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs, the idea that we are different, we are not equal. Mm. And therefore, the communist society is one wherein we are, you know, taken from and given to in all of our specificity. And in a way, mm. I think there are links to contemporary ideals of equity. Yeah, that's what I was about to say, is that reminds me so much of like the famous like equity graphic where people are moving the boxes. And, and it is it actually... Yeah, critical of of the idea of equality. Yeah, so I, so I mean, I think actually the recent history of all this stuff yeah. is not very well understood either. Um, yeah. that in the nineteenth century, I mean, certainly Marx and Engels sort of were suspicious of equality talk because they they thought it was sort of Christian. Right. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and that's so they're also very very perceptive. They're, Excellent. They're very they're very uh, critical of right. uh, you know what they call the, the 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 people they call the utopian socialists as right. well. It's for very often being kind of Christian. Yeah. Socialist. So, um, 
So yeah, so I would just so that's just a historical note to say. Well, actually, the sort of the Marxist position on equality is a little bit less yeah. straightforward. I think certainly for Marxists in the 20th century, there was a sense that equality was their principle, and equality meant economic yeah. equality and and a consideration of class. Yeah, I know. I think of like the Orwell, some are more equal than others. Mm. And now I'm like, wait a minute, how do you square that? If Marx actually wanted some to be more equal than others, genuinely. Where yeah, that, for that phrase is meant as such a pointed criticism. Yeah, and so it's a complex, it's a complex yeah. history. Um, and I just, you know, I I quote the Orwell um, line a lot mm. in my book because basically I, I am just interested in the mm. ways in which um, even egalitarians seem to think that sometimes it's, it's right that some be more equal than others. Right. Right. So for Orwell, this is a great. Um, Reductio, right? This right. is sort of showing the hypocrisy of egalitarians. But in you know, and I'm a I'm a lover of Orwell, and I you know, yeah, and yeah. I sort of absolutely accept that critique um, of you know certain sort of putatively egalitarian movements in the 20th century. However, I mean, this goes back to my idea that equality and hierarchy are sort of you know the relationship between them is a bit more complicated than we yeah. th- tend to think of. And I would just say that one of the reasons I'm so attracted to early modern political thought is because all of the um, Political philosophers that uh, you know that that we read closely from the period, so you know Hobbes above all, but also Locke, is that they're just really conscious of. They have a kind of psychological realism about human beings, and mm. just they really appreciate the fact that human beings are status conscious creatures. Yeah, definitely. Right, and so even in a society of equals. We have this consciousness of differential status. And yeah. certainly in order for a society to organize itself, there are going to have to be hierarchies mm. in the society. So the question isn't sort of are equality and hierarchy opposites. It's rather what sorts of hierarchies are acceptable Yeah, yeah. in a society of equals? And indeed, what kind of hierarchies are conducive mm. to certain ways of relating as equals? And so as a normative political theorist, that's what I'm interested in. It's sort of saying, you know, not saying, oh, well, you know, if we care about equality, then what we need is is to pull down every hierarchy. It's rather to say, okay, well, which hierarchies are equality preserving and promoting, which equalities are equality, uh, which which hierarchies are equality undermining or um, destroying. Yeah, no, it's a super, super interesting and poignant observation. I mean, to to share another kind of personal anecdote. I mean, I'm from D.C. where the top prep school is a Quaker school, so mm. well friends. Oh, yeah. And it's just where such the a, Obama girls went, right? Yeah, exactly. But it's like such a funny yeah, inconsistency because it's like the most competitive school. The president's daughters were there and such. And yet it's a Quaker school. Everyone's calling each other by their first names. Mm. And it's just what the Quakers probably originally intended versus what it's become. It's not necessarily bad to have an elite school. It's just so different, I think, from the kind of original Quaker ideology. Yeah, I mean the, the the history of Quaker, the Quaker movement is so fascinating, and you can get in trouble, right? Because yeah. um, because I mean, uh, modern day Quakers um, are rightly extremely proud of the history of the movement, yeah. but also yeah. perhaps more interested in some parts of their history than in other mm-hmm. parts of the history. But I would just say, I mean, the, the Quakerism is is interesting as a religious movement because it you know it has this these early years of real kind of conscientious incivility and social Mm. disruption. But then the movement becomes pretty hierarchical pretty quickly. They begin to have very uh, well-organized meetings. There are uh, men's meetings and women's meetings and Mm. then a kind of, you know, quite a a national and then international organization Mm. of kind of, you know, of of regional meetings and these. Anyway, so... um, that's why I always specify that I work that I'm interested in early Quakerism, right? Because right. I think that the 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 movement manages to domesticate itself pretty well. Yeah. Um. But then, yeah. Th- but that just that more general phenomenon, whereby it goes back to something um I we were talking about earlier, which is just this kind of equality. When we're talking about the equality of human beings, that's a kind of universalist principle. Yeah. You know, human beings as such, not as citizens of X or Y country, not as members of X or Y religious group, but every human being everywhere all of the time is equal. Yeah. Okay. But when it comes to actually sort of relating as equals, that's incredibly situational. Yeah. Right? Uh 
uh, does Annika get uh, some kind of privilege that I don't get or are the quality of your shoes better than mine? You know, mm. we sort of this this kind of comp- drive to comparison. Right. And that's very local, particular and situated. Yeah. Um, and so I think that it's sort of, you know, society of equals very often rely on constitutive exclusions, a sense mm. of who does not belong, who is outside the society of equals, right? And so I think the Quaker idea of the selective school, for instance, is that, well, we are a selective school, um, but we don't regard ourselves as superior yeah. to those who are not members of our community, and my, but my view as a political theorist, I go back to that psychological realism point, that's very difficult to maintain. Yeah. Once you make a distinction, I think it's very human then to want to kind of hierarchically order yeah. that distinction to say, OK, well, I distinguish between insider, outsider, and then the sense of, well, it's better to be inside yeah. than out, right? So I think that, so I describe this in the book as the primus inter pares problem, the idea that, mm. you know, we, we think that certain kinds of distinctions are compatible with equality. But distinctions have a way of yeah. organizing themselves hierarchically. Mm. So there's always this risk. Um, and we always then have to be, uh, I mean, my argument is more of a positive program, which is to say, well, then we always have to be careful about having different kinds of community in which people can relate as equals in yeah. these sort of richer, deeper ways um, and have a sense of themselves as equals and don't just... You know, the the sort of self segregation of, mm. of 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 you know Americans, for instance, into these sort of like minded enclaves in which we sort of just begin to have a sense of a kind of a little bit of contempt for those outside mm. who aren't like us. I mean, I think that is a very human tendency, but one that really needs to be um, guarded against yeah. um, from the standpoint of equality. Yeah, no, it's a super important point to bring up. Um, I mean, yeah, just like sort of the ephemeralness of communities that just completely focus on equality to the total exclusion of hierarchy, um, mm. how quickly that can deteriorate, as you notice with the Quakers. Well, they just become blind. I mean, you sort right. of become blind to it. I mean, so or I, the egalitarianism deteriorated, I should say, not the community itself. Mm. So, I mean, the reason, to just, like on a point of autobiography, autobiography I mean, yeah. the, the reason I got interested in this topic was because I was interested in the Quakers. So that right. came out of my oh, first book. Oh, interesting. But okay. also because I moved to Oxford as an American right. in 2015. And Oxford is is a place where it's a first name basis, mm. has this kind of academic egalitarianism. So Oxford has traditionally been the home of a lot of egalitarian political philosophizing. Mm. So, you know, political theorists and philosophers who regarded themselves as egalitarians and then also has this kind of egalitarian uh academic culture. But of course, that coexists with profound hierarchies in a profoundly exclu- mm. exclusionary sense of who belongs oh, yeah. and who does not in Oxford. And so as an American coming in, I was like, oh, you know, great. If, you know, OK, right. First name basis. Oh, right. Oh, wait. So first name basis. But like, it's very clear. Yeah. What the pecking order is. 100%. And I found as an American coming in, as a young woman coming in, actually being stripped of my title mm. as Dr. Bejan or Professor Bejan was actually very um, difficult. It made it very difficult for me to do my job. Yeah. Right? So if, you know, students, for instance, just assume that they can call you by your first name, I mean, I can understand why that might be appealing to some of my older, more senior male colleagues who want to sort of, oh, yes, just call me Jim. Right. But for me to be able to say, no, I'm Professor Bejan, right. that's a way of communicating to students that I'm the professor, you're the student. And I think, um, so that's a kind of, I mean, so that's a question where I think, I think it's just fascinating from the standpoint of equality. Because yeah. you might say, well, no, equality means that, you know, we should all be on a first name basis. Yeah. But you might also say, well, no, equality means that women or minority faculty should be able to enjoy the title in the same way that their older male colleagues have always been able to enjoy it, you know? Yeah. So I think that's an excellent illustration of the demands of equality seem seeming to cut in totally different directions. Yeah. I mean, when I, I studied abroad at Oxford, my experience was so similar. You just like, you can't even check a book out of a library, literally, as an abroad student. And it's just such a, like, there's no point to it except to be like, you're studying abroad, you're an outsider. 
Um, and if it makes you feel better, when I lived in California, I insisted on calling everyone doctor, professor all the time. They tried all kinds of tricks to get me to stop, but I would not. <laughs> but <laughs> I just think, yeah, I think yeah. I, I, um... it's important, though, like to acknowledge like you're actually not an equal with your professor in like a very real sense when you're in a classroom. Yeah, I think titles are mutually protective. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so that that's a good example of a university is a is a very hierarchical kind of institution. Yeah. But I nevertheless think that universities can foster sites of equality, sites mm-hmm. of parity. So where we meet sort of as peers, especially in a seminar classroom, you know, it's yeah. re- regarding everyone as having something worth saying, yeah, and having a voice, and. You know, in order to cultivate that parity, you need, though, to have a strong sense of hierarchy, sort of, okay, you know, who's a member of the seminar and who's not? There's exclusion there. And who's leading the discussion? Yeah. And who's not? Right. Who's in a position to evaluate, to grade, to instruct all of these things? And so I think that's an excellent example of a kind of, you know, a a kind of uh, sort of a a community of equals being Mm. created and preserved by a kind of hierarchical institution. Mm. And so um, that, you know, so that that goes to the point of, you know, as egalitarians, you know, if if we are egalitarians, we shouldn't necessarily be critics of or trying to pull down Mm. hierarchical institutions wherever we find them. We should be thinking okay, is this an institution or is this a hierarchical relationship that actually preserves or enables certain kinds of um, relational equality? Yeah, super interesting. I know we're running up against the clock here, but one last question. Um, So, you know, the levelers, they kind of go down in history. The people right contemporaneously with them hate them. Um, And they go down as these sort of crazy radicals who were trying to tear everything down. And yet kind of in some of the specifics of their program, it seems as though we've adopted a lot of their ideas kind of wholesale. Um, So I guess, you know, from your kind of perspective now, having done all this research about the levelers, um, is it can you sort of make that simplistic statement that, oh, history proved them right? Or or how should we view them? Oh, I think it's a really... um... Interesting question, but it's a bit of a hard question because certainly the leveler movement. So maybe we should distinguish here between the the levelers. So um, this group of political radicals Mm. who are sort of led loosely by a guy named John Lilburn in the late 1640s. And then the true levelers, the diggers, the people people are sort of, you know, doing this sort of crazy uh, experiments yeah. of living a bit later we on. We didn't abolish private property. I, that's fair. Maybe yeah. it's the levelers. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so it, it's the, the movement exists only briefly. Uh, they, can, you know, they didn't really achieve any of their political mm. demands. But certainly in terms of their kind of ideology, if you yeah. will, they were hugely successful. Yeah. And I, and I think about it in terms of um, speaking Lilburn's language. This mm. is a phrase that gets thrown around. It's the language of the rights and liberties of freeborn Englishmen mm. that really gets picked up mm. and does sort of echo down the ages. Um, so the leveler movement kind of peters out in the early days of the English Commonwealth, and it's basically brutally suppressed because mm. the levelers are regarded as uh, traitors to the new Republican regime, mm. which is sort of counterintuitive for us because we thought, oh, weren't you all just an- against the monarchy? But no, no, no. It's mm. The levelers become very critical of the Republican regime and Oliver Cromwell. That's really interesting. Yeah. Mm. So they're sort of brutally suppressed. But nevertheless, there is this kind of echo of, of Lilburn's language, thinking about the rights of Englishmen, thinking of Magna Carta right. as every Englishman's birthright. And that mm-hmm. way of thinking absolutely influences what we might think of the Commonwealth tradition, mm-hmm. right, which will then get translated and picked up, you know, uh, in in the colonies and feed pretty more or less directly mm-hmm. into revolutionary ferment in, you know, the colonies of British North America in That's the 18th amazing. century. Mm. Um, so, yeah. So, again, I, I don't want to say that, you know, it's not direct influence in the sense that right. no people aren't sort of reading Lilburn's pamphlets and sort of taking his ideas. But there's something about the, the, the language and the kind of constitution of a tradition of thinking of, of thinking about the mm. common law and sort of 
intertwining that with kind of Christian arguments about the creation of human beings in mm. God's image or um, God is no respecter of persons, all these things. It becomes just a incredibly powerful and sort of ef- effective political ideology that, can, that gets uh, picked up and used by other people. Mm. That's like, yeah, such an amazing observation that, that this movement that people in America have like mostly pretty much never heard of or maybe heard of is I think I heard of it, you know, is like a blip in my AP U.S. history kind of textbook more so than like really dug into that it had such a big impact um, and was in the water so much when the American Revolution was fermenting. So It's pretty interesting to me, though, actually, because I think maybe in the U.K. the levelers are just far just uh, just a lot better known because there is this yeah. sense of there was a kind of revival of the levelers in the 20th century and a sense of, OK, well, this is the. This is the beginning of a kind of English radical Mm. tradition. So we would draw a line from like the levelers in the 17th century to the Chartists. Mm. Um, Okay. And then, yeah. So, but I, but I think, I think that you're right that, um, that, you know, the, we should talk about them more and we should talk about them more in specificity as opposed to just kind of gesturing towards them and saying, okay, and they're a precursor to Locke or a precursor uh, to whomever, um, so, yeah, so that's yeah. part of what I'm doing in the book. Yeah, super interesting. Really appreciate it. Cannot wait for the book to come out. Um, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time, Teresa. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, there you have it, Madisonians. Dr. Teresa Bijan on equality, equity, and hierarchy, both in the early modern period and today. I hope that you enjoyed this discussion as much as I did. I think it really adds a lot of light to modern debates about these concepts. If you want to learn more about us and what we do, our website is jmp.princeton.edu. We have tons of events. We have an email list. We have lecture recordings. So there are tons of ways to get involved. I really encourage you to check it out. You can also find us on Twitter at Madison Program as well as Instagram and Facebook. Thanks so much for tuning in. And I hope to catch you next time here on Madison's Notes. Madison's Notes.